okay welcome back so uh, if you recall in the last lecture we have wrapped up our uh, portion for mos uh, mosfet mos transistors we have finished up uh, the mos cap mosfet with all the short channel effects and the derivation of gradual channel approximation the idvd the uh, you know related things like uh, charge sharing in the short channel model and back substrate uh, bias effect steep substitutional things and all so we now have a basic understanding of mosfet and please be advised and remember that mosfets are the building blocks of most of the modern digital logics and circuits so now whatever we have learned till now has been primarily based on silicon because silicon is the most widely used semiconductor almost all the electronic devices are made of silicon however uh, today we shall start a new topic of compound semiconductors uh, many of you may not be familiar with compound semiconductors but uh, please remember that actually unknowingly we keep using compound semiconductor devices every day in our life and they are extremely critical and crucial for our technology today every time you connect to the internet you are actually using compound semiconductor devices uh, so these are non silicon devices and they are not there to replace silicon or compete with silicon but they complement silicon there are certain functionalities that silicon cannot do for example silicon cannot emit light right you need light at different wavelengths for example so that's an opto part even in electronics there would be some limitations of silicon in terms of getting very high speed operation in terms of our rf power amplifier or very high power switching so compound semiconductor comes in those applications where silicon you know uh, doesn't perform or cannot perform for example and they are very cru crucial elements for modern technology okay your cell phone is a very uh, smartphone is a very good example of how different types of compound semiconductor technologies have come together to actually enable the smartphone that you are using today okay so today uh, and the next few lectures we will essentially start with the introduction to compound semiconductor and the band diagrams of compound semiconductor and when you have different materials you call them heterostructure so we'll cover heterostructure band diagrams current flow current transport and some of the common devices like transistors based on compound semiconductor quantum wells and so on this will also form the basis for leds uh, and other devices that we will study subsequently okay so let's come to the whiteboard and we'll assume that you know you recall the basic semiconductor device uh, fundamentals from the earlier classes like uh, things like pn junction drift diffusion continuity equation mobility all these things you know so we'll be using them here very often so today we shall start compound semiconductor and many <coughs> textbooks as well as courses probably do not treat compound semiconductors in details uh, but these are an essential element an essential ingredient of our life today so compound semiconductors are when you combine two different semiconductors for example uh, the two different elements for example silicon is a single element so it's called elementary semiconductor and germanium is also elementary semiconductor but you might want to uh, combine two elements of different groups okay so if you look into the periodic table so in group 3 you will have many elements and then group 4 you will have many elements then group 5 you have many elements so typically there are many kinds of and categories of compound semiconductor but the word compound semiconductor means that you are combining two different elements of two different probably groups of the periodic table and making a semiconductor now all sorts of possible combinations will not give you a semiconductor there are certain combinations of your uh, elements of different groups in a periodic table that will give you your uh, compound semiconductor for example in in your group 3 you will have aluminum you will have gallium you will have indium for example in group 5 you will have you know things like arsenic and phosphorus and of course nitrogen and so on right so if you combine this group with that group you might get what is called the conventional 3 5 semiconductors conventional 3 5 semiconductor means you are combining uh, the group 3 uh, which is aluminum or gallium or indium these are the group 3 uh, group 3 elements you can say and in group 5 you are combining either arsenic or phosphorus okay so these these combinations are called conventional 3 5 semiconductors they are widely used uh, in a lot of devices and applications actually for example so you can have different combination you can have gallium arsenide you can have gallium phosphide you can have aluminum arsenide you can have aluminum phosphide right you can have indium arsenide you can have indium phosphide these are the combinations you can have in terms of two two elements each this, each of these has two two elements and these are semiconductors these are semiconductor so they display properties that are uh, you know that define them as semiconductors you can dope them n type p type and so on so these are semiconductors and these are compound semiconductors but they are binary semiconductors the reason we call them binary semiconductors is because they have only two elements that are there um, and of course each of this will have its own band gap so it will have its own band gap okay and band gap is a very fundamental uh, property or parameter you know of a material so each of these has their own band gap that's great so maybe uh, for example gallium arsenide has a band gap of 1.4 ev okay for example aluminum arsenide has a band gap of around 
2.2 EV. So that's great. So you have different band gaps. So different elements here, different compounds will of course have different band gaps. Um, and along with band gaps, each of this material will ha also have its own effective mass. You remember the effective mass of gallium arsenide, effective mass of gallium phosphide, they will all be different. That's great. So you have a lot of, you know, it's like a zoo of materials that you can play with. The silicon has a fixed band gap, which is 1.1 EV. Silicon also has a fixed effective mass. Of course, that depends on the direction. But, uh, you know, silicon has only one element and uh, you, you have a fixed band gap. You have to live with a fixed band gap. You have to live with a fixed effective mass and hence at a fixed mobility at a room, tem at room temperature. You have a fixed, uh, you know, you cannot, you do not have the flexibility of doing many things uh, with silicon, for example. So here you have so many different compounds they have different band gaps they have different effective masses they will have different mobilities so what happens is that you can have more flexibility in designing devices right you can get more functionalities in designing devices because you can combine material that have different band gaps and they will the different band gaps and different you know uh, your effective masses and so on they will give different properties you can actually harness them to make devices that are not possible with silicon it's like you have only you know one type of food that you are eating with silicon but here you have a you have a lot of cuisines a lot of food types that you have to eat so you can get you can select a lot more uh, possibilities from these compound semiconductors and that will give you new devices which are not possible with silicon that's what i am trying to say okay uh, now each of this uh, material each of this uh, semiconductor also will have its own lattice constant if you remember uh, if you remember what is lattice constant you know the element these compounds will have this uh, spacing uh, this spacing between these atoms the constant it's always constant this is called a you know the lattice constant of course i'm drawing a simple picture it may not uh, this is called c this is a, the direction but the c and a may not be equal it may be simple cubic and it may be equal anyways the lattice constant it's the lattice constant of these different elements gallium arsenide indium phosphide you know aluminum arsenide all these things the lattice constant also will be different and that has a major role actually we'll see that very soon uh, and of course when i say lattice constant it's not like gallium 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 it's a gallium arsenide so you will have a gallium atom, you will have arsenic atom and it will have its own st crystal structure and when I talk about lattice constant, I talk about the, uh, I do not talk about the spacing between gallium to gallium atom or the arsenic to arsenic atom. I look at the unit cell and in the unit cell, you know, if you have a unit cell like this for example, it is a, if you have a unit cell like that, then you will have to look at the, 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 the dimension of the unit cell in order to be able to tell what is the spacing or what is the lattice constant okay. so anyways this, there are different kinds of crystal structures hexagon fcc bcc and so on so crystal structure will define what is the spacing in the lattice so in a way the lattice constants of these different materials are very different and so that has a big role to play we will see that okay now this is only uh, this is only group 3 5 i am talking about now uh, one in interesting thing is that for example i have gallium arsenide and this is a compound semiconductor and this is 1.4 uh, ev for example and then i have aluminum arsenide which is for example 2.2 EV. Now actually you know what I can make an alloy, I can make an alloy uh, based on gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide. Okay? I can make an alloy based on gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide and what it will do is that if I mix this in some proportion, in some fraction, then I will be able to uh, tune the band gap actually. I can, I can tune the band gap anywhere between 1.4 you know, to 2.2 EV, I can, I can tune the band gap. I can get the band gap anything I want between these two uh, by making an alloy appropriately. Okay? So that kind of flexibility is not with silicon. You can actually decide what band gap you want. For example, if I, 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 I might want to take like, you know, uh, I might want to take say for example, I might want to take 30% of gallium arsenide and I mix it with 70% of aluminum arsenide. Okay? It means if I have a, you know, if I have a plane of atoms here, all these atoms are there. 70% of the group 3 atom sites, you know, you have group 3 sites, atom sites that where group 3 elements can go, 70% of those sites are occupied by aluminum and the rest 30% are occupied by gallium. So this one layer or one mono layer of this thing will be 30% gallium and 70% aluminum and you keep growing layer by layer, you keep growing layer by layer so you will get eventually a bulk, you will get a semiconductor which is like thick bulk maybe say 1 micron, yeah, 300 nanometer and so on. And this will have 30% gallium uh, of, you know, the gallium arsenide and 70% it will have aluminum in group 3 sites. So I can call that aluminum 70, gallium 30, arsenic, both of them are arsenic of course, right. So this is called L gas, aluminum, gallium arsenide and here I am using 70% aluminum, 30% gallium. I can use anything. I can use 
20 percent aluminum then I will use 80 percent gallium. So, essentially I am using an alloy and the band gap of this will change. So, by mixing this alloy in appropriate amount you can actually change the band gap from gallium arsenides 1.4 EV to aluminum arsenides 2.2 EV ok. And so, the generic expression would be I am using aluminum x fraction where x is less than 1 and I am using gallium which is 1 minus x and then arsenic. If x is equal to 1 then you get pure aluminum arsenide right and if x is equal to 0 then you get pure gallium arsenide which means uh, which means by changing the band gap after changing x, x is the mole fraction from 0 to 1 right. So, I told you aluminum gallium 1 minus x arsenic. So, when when you are uh, you have a 0 you have a z and on the y axis I am plotting for example, the band gap in electron volt. So, when I have x is equal to 0 which means aluminum is 0 and gallium is 100 percent right when then I will have a band gap of 1.4 EV here right and then you know as I keep increasing to 1 at 1 when I have x equal to 1 I will have only aluminum arsenide which band gap is 2.2 EV. So, maybe 2.2 EV is here right. So, I will have a change in the band gap like this right. So, essentially and I can go to any band gap I want and I can choose the x that I want you agree right that is that is the beauty of tailing tailoring the band gap ok. So, I am changing the mole fraction I am doing that. So, this kind of compounds say for aluminum gallium arsenide I am not writing the x here, but it is always assumed there or indium gallium phosphide indium gallium arsenide aluminum gallium sorry aluminum gallium phosphide indium aluminum arsenide right so many combinations indium aluminum phosphide these are this type of materials uh, com, um, some, some compound semiconductors are called ternary because they have three elements these are called ternary compound semiconductors ok ternary compound semiconductors and in ternary se compound semiconductors you are actually able to tune the band gap between the two edges of the binary ok. So, for example, if I take indium aluminum phosphide it means I have x here I have 1 minus x here. I can have a band gap of indium phosphide I do not recall what the value is, but you can look up into Google and then you have aluminum phosphide you can go from the band gap of indium phosphide to aluminum phosphide by changing the mole fraction. So, you can get alloys ok these are ternary semiconductor uh, of course, you know, here the group 3 element is fixed as phosphide or arsenide you can also have things like gallium arsenic arsenide phosphide or indium arsenide phosphide, but those are little bit more you know. Uh, 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 they are they are they are there they have been also widely studied, but we will not talk much about them it is also not very easy to grow them and also uh, those are also used in many other devices, but we are only talking about when the group 5 is only one which is arsenic and so you have say indium gallium arsenide for example, this kind of materials which is by the way indium gallium arsenide this is very widely used in uh, fiber optic by the way ok fiber optic communication uh, you will realize actually. So, anytime we are connecting to internet you are using fiber optic communication and you are actually using indium gallium arsenide. Um, you know laser diodes for example, or detectors uh, to uh, to send the, op the, the signal at around 1.55 micron that is the wavelength of the infrared signal at which your optical fiber carries the information. Uh, and every time you are using the internet you are actually using 1.55 micron uh, wavelength of signal uh, that goes in the fiber optic cable uh, in gas detectors in gas LED laser diodes are being used there. So, every time you connect to the internet you are actually using some compound semiconductors we do not just know that yet right. Uh, so, uh, so, so there, there, there is this different things with one one you know a family of semiconductor of course, there is also something called a quaternary and that those are also used, but not as much probably uh, quaternary semiconductors you will have four elements it is like aluminum indium gallium phosphide. So, aluminum indium gallium arsenide these are four different elements will be there. So, you will have the total of this has to be one ok. So, it will be like aluminum uh, y indium x gallium 1 minus x minus y arsenic ok. These are also quaternary semiconductor where you can tune the band gap even more uh, although of course, uh, those are used for some special cases we will not discuss so much about them here ok. Uh, anyways, so what we have now seen is that uh, group 3 5 semiconductors uh, are one of the most common and you know widely studied compound semiconductor, but there are also other compound semiconductors that you can actually uh, you know get by mixing and matching the elements from different groups. So, this is 3 5, but there is also you know <coughs> there is also you have 2 6, 2 6 means 2 6 compound semiconductor means you are actually using uh, elements from group 2 
and group 6 oh sorry not this is not 4 2 6 2 uh, 2 6 ok. Uh, for example, cadmium telluride cadmium telluride is a group 2 6 semiconductor you will have alloys of that also something like say mercury, mercury cadmium telluride. So, these are semiconductors that also have a very wide range of applications and these are elements of group 2 and group 6 that you are combining to make group 2 6 semiconductors for example, mercury uh, cadmium telluride uh, is very very promising and widely used for mid IR mid IR photo detector ok. Because the band gap of these materials can be are very low actually when the band gap is very very low then the wavelength that you can detect is very very large. So, mid IR means around 2 micron to 5 micron wavelength remember your human eye is visible it can only see from around 3.36 micron to around 0 0.75 micron probably right that is the range of human eye. And when I say mid IR I am talking about 2 micron wavelength to 5 micron wavelength and you need a very small band gap and mercury cadmium telluride for example, uh, is a very promising semiconductor in that it can actually detect your mid IR detect signals and mercury cadmium telluride is a group 2 6 there will be group 2 here right group 2 here and then group 6 here. So, it is a group 2 6 sort of a compound semiconductor that is also there you know. So, so there are many kinds of semiconductors that are there. There is also uh, antimonides uh, in case antimonides ok. You these are all compound semiconductor antimonides. So, antimony you know antimony is SB. So, antimonides will have SB. So, you will have say indium antimonide or gallium antimonide and al aluminum antimonide this antimonides are also compound semiconductors and antimonides have very low band gap typically very low band gap and so they are also useful for IR detection mid IR detection for example and their mobilities are very high the band gaps are very low their band gap can be as low as 0.1 EV 0.2 EV uh, <coughs> the very very low band gaps materials uh, gallium arsenide gallium phosphide could be slightly bigger a larger band gap than silicon if silicon is 1.1 EV. Uh, you can see that these band gaps are much smaller gallium arsenide gallium phosphide the band gaps are 1.4 EV to 2.2 EV those are uh, in that range uh, they are also a little bit larger band gap than silicon. Of course, indium arsenide has a little lower band gap uh, and <coughs> indium arsenide and this gallium antimonide for example, uh, these heterostructures are actually used when I say heterost I will come to heterostructure this kind of stuck stuck stacks are used also for mid IR uh, mid IR detection and they compete for example, this technology competes competes with uh, I just told you mercury cadmium telluride. So, this mercury cadmium telluride for mid IR detection uh, for that uh, that that area is also competed with indium arsenide gallium antimonide uh, sort of a structure. So, these are also low band gap material for example, I told you the band gap of a material is easy then the light it can detect for example, H c by lambda. So, lambda will be equal to H c by E g and one of the easiest way is that you so it is 1 2 4 2 divided by the E g in E v will give you the band gap at uh, the wavelength in nanometer. So, for example, if you have a band gap of uh, <coughs> 0 point say 2 E v ok. Uh, so, it will be a 0 0.1 E v for example, 0 0.1 E v 0 0.1 E v uh, that will give you around 12420 nanometer which is equal to 12 micron which is actually far I r ok, far I r this is far infrared detection ok that is far infrared detection. For example, if you have uh, you know a band gap of say the band gap of material is around say 0 0.4 EV then you will have lambda is equal to 1 2 4 2 by 0 0.4 um, that will be basically 12420 by 4. So, that is like 3 uh, 14 or so on. So, it will be around 3 micron. So, that is mid IR. So, you see if a band gap 4.4 EV can be used for mid IR spectroscopy mid IR detection. So, these are also antimonides are also a class of very important materials for you know optical detection mid IR detection and nowadays Intel also is doing a lot of research on antimonides for high speed transistors next generation very low power these are low band gap materials where they can enable high speed devices. Um, so, there is so many categories of compound semiconductors we are only talking about of course, inorganic semiconductors these are all inorganic materials and inorganic semiconductors, but there can be also organic semiconductors which is not within the limit of this textbook. So, will not uh, of this course. So, we will not decide discuss on them, but organic semiconductors are basically car carbon oxygen hydrogen bond based uh, or complex organic molecules uh, organic semiconductors have their own speciality in that you can bend them. So, they can be used to make uh, flexible 
devices you can make flexible displays you can make transparent displays and many of your smartphone uh, touch screens and many of such applications actually use organic semiconductors you just may not be aware of that right so organic semiconductors are also widely used that is not within this course uh, limit so we will not discuss about them whatever is whatever we are discussing till now is actually we are discussing your inorganic semiconductors so all these are inorganic semiconductors i told you about the uh, <coughs> what did i tell you i told you about conventional 35 semiconductors gallium arsenide gallium phosphide base i told you about 26 cadmium telluride mercury cadmium telluride and there are quite a few others there actually and then i also told you about the antimonides gallium antimonide and all antimonide -antim they are very very low band gap material 0 0.1 0 0.2 ev sort of things uh, <coughs> there are also a few other compound semiconductors there are also a few other compound semiconductors so for example uh, I did not tell you about the applications, I will come to the applications once I introduce the semiconductors here. There is a lot of lot of applications, I will come to that. So, for example, in group 3 and this is group 4 for example and then you have group 5. I told you about aluminum and then gallium and then indium, uh, right. But I told you about like arsenic and phosphorus and so on, but there is also in group 5, you know, arsenic and phosphorus you have, but also there is, excuse me, there is nitrogen here. And this el group elements can actually combine it also nitrogen to form either aluminum nitride or gallium nitride or indium nitride. Uh, you can also make alloys of that I told you right like aluminum, gallium, nitride, indium, gallium, nitride these are turn these are binary, uh, these are binary right these are ternary. You can make indium, aluminum, nitride these are quaternary, these are ternary and quaternary can be in aluminum, aluminum, gallium, nitride. These are also 3, 5, but we call them typically 3 nitrides, okay. 3 nitride semiconductors and 3 nitride semiconductors are also uh, very, very important. You know, every time you see uh, a white LED, you know, white LEDs you can buy now from Big Bazaar and Amazon and every other shop that you in your neighborhood shop will have you white LEDs, Cisco LED and all this thing, right. This white LED actually is made up of indium gallium nitride, by the way, gallium nitride. So, 3 nitrides have enabled the white LEDs which is more than 12 billion dollar market. It is a 12 billion dollar market more than more than that actually. It has got the Nobel Prize in 2014 by the way, Physics Nobel Prize you can check that okay. Physics Nobel Prize in 2014 uh, 4 years back 5 years back. So, white LEDs are one of the areas where these 3 nitrides have revolutionized. You can buy white light LEDs everywhere and the reason they are replacing the incandescent lamp and tube light is that they may be a little expensive right now, but they are cheap becoming cheap becoming cheaper every day. They are actually much more efficient, they do not become warm. If you touch them, they are not warm like that incandescent bulb which means they are very efficient, they will last very long and they are they save your power essentially. That is why all the parking garages, street lights, stadiums, if you go to airports and all everything is white LED. So, uh, you have this 3 nitride semiconductors also compound semiconductor one of the applications of 3 nitride semiconductor is that white leds is is, is really literally touching our lives every day okay so uh, these are there are different categories of semiconductors i told you there are also some unique semiconductors like silicon carbide silicon and carbon combined silicon carbide silicon carbide is also a semiconductor it's a compound semiconductor it's a group 4 4 semiconductor silicon is group 4 silicon carbon carbon is also group 4 but silicon carbide is a group 4 uh, uh, group 4 for it's a compound semiconductor uh, then there are oxides you know then there are oxides oxides essentially like they are also compound semiconductor for example you might take gallium and you might take oxygen but the compound is typically gallium ox oxide, 2 gallium, 1 oxygen, 3 oxygen. Gallium oxide uh, is also a semiconductor these days, it is getting a lot of attention. If you want to do research and PhD, gallium oxide is a very hot topic these days for next generation power electronics. Um, these are these are also materials, they are also indium oxides and so on. Uh, aluminum oxide by the way is sapphire, uh, it is it's actually very white, it is insulator almost, but people are trying to also dope it. Um, so, gallium oxide, the oxides are another family of compound semiconductors, right. Uh, and then let me come back to the new slide. So, I have told you about uh, group 3, 5, I have told you about group 2, 6, then I told you about the antimonides, then I told you about the group 3 nitrides, then I told you about silicon carbide, then I told you about the oxides. Oxides not only have things like gallium oxide, but it will also have more complex oxides. Uh, you can have perovskites, uh, which are a little bit more advanced and complicated kind of materials. Uh, these are not, they are used for solar cells by the way, perovskite solar cells are very 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 hot topic in research and then you have double pair of skies and so on you might have things like gadolinium uh, strontium oxide 
the for I am not able to recall the formula here exactly, but gadolinium strontium oxide, you have uh, strontium titanium oxide, right? Strontium titanium oxide. So, there are different kinds of oxides also there, they are also called complex oxides, and they are um, they may not be necessarily semiconductors, some of them are semiconductors, uh, you can dope them and stuff like that. Those are also different categories of semiconductor compound semiconductors that are giving you know new functionalities, new 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 types of devices and so on. Then there is this wide a very large uh, you know proliferating and a very large range of devices that are going on which are based on layered 2D materials, layered 2D materials and you should be aware of this because this is a very hot area of research and future of electronics people say that it will lie in 2D materials you never know. It started with the boom of graphene that you might have heard and the graphene that got the Nobel prize I guess in 2010, Novozelov and Gaim had got that. Graphene is a sheet of one dimension, you know, it is a two dimensional sheet of carbon atoms and because it is only carbon it is not compound semiconductor okay typically technically speaking, but there is a zoo like hundreds of 2D materials have been discovered and synthesized and grown these days and you have so many varieties and they are mostly compound semiconductor, MOS2 molybdenum sulphide, tungsten sulphide for example, uh, molyb sorry molybdenum selenide tungsten selenide, molybdenum telluride, tungsten telluride, these are and there are many added, these are layered 2D materials and are called you know transition metal dichalcogenides, dichalcogenide, you should be aware of these things, transition metal dichalcogenides TMDs, these are layered 2D materials, there are many, many others out of them, okay. I am just giving you a few example, there is indium selenide right there is rhenium selenide there is uh, gallium selenide there is gallium sulfide so many materials are there so so many there is uh, phosphorine and so many other things. these are layer 2d all these are layer 2d materials like graphene only in the sense that you can have just one sheet of one layer one monolayer one layer of atoms of 2d you know of 2d uh, it's a two dimensional sheet just one layer you know conventional silicon or gallium arsenide or gallium oxide and all these things are actually like a bulk you know it is a thick layer of you know it is a thick wafer or a thick layer right. But this is just one layer, one atomic layer I repeat one atomic layer, one sheet of atomic layer of material can be made. You can also make two layers, three layers, four layers and multi layers and so on. But with gallium nitride for example or silicon for example or gallium phosphide, gallium arsenide and all these things it is not easy or it is not it is not common to be able to get one layer of say you know gallium arsenide and just suspend it you know like that. You can grow gallium arsenide layer by layer one layer by one layer, but on top of some substrate okay on some platform these are this can be standalone and this can be done by Scott step method which uh, is also you know research area, but that is that is a different thing. But these are two dimensional material. So, essentially it is like a sheet of atoms that do not have outer plane bonds they are very weak outer plane bonds. You see if you have a bulk material bulk crystal then you have bonds in all three directions x, y, z. Here you will have only in x and y direction. The z direction is free there is only one sheet one layer. So, the z direction bonding is weak van der Waals forces it is very weak and you can peel them off layer by layer. So, you can peel one layer of say molybdenum sulphide you can put on one layer of molybdenum telluride. You can put one layer peel one layer of the tungsten telluride and put it on silicon or whatever right that kind of flexibility and you know ability to put any material on any substrate or any material on any combination is very very difficult near impossible to achieve in all this conventional compound semiconductor. These are also compound semiconductor, but these are different kinds of compound semiconductor they are called 2D layered materials. The reason it is almost impossible to get this kind of a flexibility in this conventional semiconductor you will see later on is that this conventional semiconductors, this conventional semiconductors have to be grown on some platform because they are bulk they are thick. And when you grow on platform uh, there is a lot of problem with lattice mismatch we will come to that. These materials actually do not have that problem you can peel them off one layer and put it on another layer somewhere and you do not have the problem of lattice mismatch because the outer plane bonding is very weak okay. Outer plane bonding is very weak. Uh, so, these are actually a very new categories of material that you should be generally familiar should be aware of that these are things that are being done to in today's world okay. And lot and lot of new sensing photo detection and transistor applications are enabling this the next generation belongs to materials okay. You know human civilization has always progressed from materials stone age, bronze age, iron age those ages are defined by the material that are used 
iron age with iron, bronze age with bronze. We are living in a silicon age where everything we do and see around is defined by silicon because our semiconductor technology is the one that is driving our civilization now, right. Similarly, the next generation will be of different material. It is the material that defines the technology, right. So, 2D materials are believed to be the next generation of low power high speed computing and many other things you should be generally aware of that. Okay? So, band gap, lattice constant, effective mass of all these also will be different. The band gap of MOS2 for example, it is around 1.8 electron volt if it is one single layer. If you have many layers together then it will be 1.2 electron volt. Okay? And many of these materials will be direct band gap, many of these materials will be indirect band gap. If you recall what is direct and what is indirect, in direct band gap material you can emit light, in indirect band gap material you cannot emit light. Silicon is indirect band gap, gallium arsenide is direct band gap, gallium nitride is direct band gap, but silicon carbide is indirect band gap, so many things are there, right. MOS2 for example, these layered materials are very unique and beautiful. If you have a single layer of MOS2, a single sheet of MOS2 atoms, it is 1.8 electron volt and this is direct band gap material. If you have many layers of MOS2 stacked on top of each other, it is a thick MOS2 crystal, then your band gap is 1.2 and that band gap of 1.2 is indirect band gap material. So, you can actually not only change the band gap of the material by the number of layers you are giving, but also you can change whether it is direct or indirect depending on the number of layers. This kind of beauty and fancy things are not available in many of the conventional semiconductors and especially certainly not in silicon. In conventional semiconductor like gallium arsenide and gallium phosphide, you can uh, indium gallium arsenide, you can make these alloys you can make these alloys and tune the band gap, tune the material parameters, tune the mobility and so on and you can get lot of devices. Here you can also divide can, another dimension you have, you have the number of layers that you can put. You can also make alloys of this material like you can make molybdenum, tungsten, you know MOX, W1 minus X, S2. This is called molybdenum tungsten sulphide. This kind of alloys can be made. Research is not very strong yet on these alloys of this or you know of this kind of um, 2D materials, but it is going on every day. There is new papers coming out. So, these are areas that you can think of you know taking up research if you are interested in future. A lot of new things are coming up, new, new technologies are coming up on all this. Okay? So, that was a brief introduction of compound semiconductor and now going ahead what we shall do. Uh, we shall discuss a few things. We shall discuss something called Weigert's law. I will tell you what Weigert's law is. We will discuss uh, about uh, things like epitaxy because those are important for practical things, epitaxy and lattice mismatch, okay. epitaxy and lattice mismatch. This is little bit of materials that we should be aware of in doing compound semiconductor. Then we do talk about the heterostructures, okay. we will talk about heterostructures. Okay. Uh, so, these things, these three things we will try to cover in the next class. Um, so, we will end up the class here today. Uh, we will end up the class here today and what you have done today is that we have introduced compound semiconductor which are very dis different from silicon uh, that we have been always studying till now. You have seen that compound semiconductors have a wide range of variety that brings with them a wide range of band gaps and all the other associated properties like effective mass and hence mobility and so many other things. Uh, there are many types of compound semiconductor group 3, 5, 2, 6 and 3 nitrides, antimonides, oxides, so many they have so much of variety of band gap. There is a new variety of material 2D materials that are also compound semiconductor, but they are 2D layered materials. They have no outer plane bonding, very weak outer plane bonding. You can have layer by layer deposition, layer by layer materials. Those bring an additional flexibility to designing devices. These are a huge area of research. Okay in conventional semiconductor or compound semiconductor also uh, there is a lot of research going on. Every time you are using the internet, the smartphone, the television, the laptops you are actually using se compound semiconductors in addition to silicon which is always there in your CMOS logic. Excuse all your processors, memories and all these things are based, based on silicon, but apart from silicon also you have so many other things that compound semiconductors are making life better. The white light LEDs, the backlit panels, Okay. The touch screen, the high performance transistor that makes your radio signal, you know, uh, re, uh, you transmit and receive more efficiently in your cell phone. So many other things are done by compound semiconductor. So, we have made a very basic introduction to the different types of compound semiconductor, what are the uses and what are the different ways we can understand them and so on. The next class, we will study three things, Weger's law, epitaxy and heterostructures we will introduce. Uh, thereafter, we will continue after next to next class, we will continue with heterostructures and heterostructure band diagrams. We will introduce some devices based on those so that we can understand them. Okay? So, we will end the class here. Thank you for your time.